the U.S. Constitution. One third of the signers were known to be Freemasons. Brown says his research led him to a conclusion that might shock some people. America wasn't founded a Christian country. It became a Christian country. The important thing to remember with the Masons and the Founding Fathers is that many of the Founding Fathers were deists. Deists believe that a supreme being created the universe, but that being is impersonal. It won't answer your prayers or even hear them. So when you talk about the Founding Fathers, who believed in deism as opposed to theism? Almost all of them. Give me names. Uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams. The, there are a lot of people who say there is no proof, for example, that Thomas Jefferson was a Freemason. That is true, but certainly a deist. Thomas Jefferson went so far as to take the Holy Bible and remove all of the references to anything miraculous, uh, to the resurrection, to the virgin birth. Jefferson himself said that the idea of the virgin birth, Christ springing from a virgin, would one day seem as much like myth as the idea of Minerva springing from the head of Jupiter. The Founding Fathers, Brown says, didn't just read the Bible. They also read Roman and Egyptian mythology. And they read the stars. This reliance on astrology, what, what does it tell you? What does it suggest about our Founding Fathers? I think that they had a respect for what they did not understand, a respect for the heavens. It, it would be hard to imagine Barack Obama taking a trip or doing the groundbreaking on a, on a major monument or something and using astrology as a basis for the time and the place he'd be ridiculed. And, and rightly so, I believe. Why was it okay then and is it not okay now? Well, for the same reason it was okay to believe that uh, if you threw a virgin into the ocean, a storm wouldn't hit you. Uh, that's you know, not okay now. That's, that's no, not okay, okay. either. All right. uh, you know, science progresses. In the lost symbol, Moloch thinks that by learning the secrets of the Freemasons, he can become something like a god. You might be surprised to learn the founders had a similar idea. And there is a painting in the Capitol? Yes. Tell me about it. Well, it's a painting that I was shocked to find was there. I said there is a painting called The Apotheosis of Washington. Apotheosis meaning the God-making of Washington. George Washington becoming a God. It seemed almost irreverential. It was like, how can a man become a God? But it really, to my eye and, and to other historians' eye, catches this concept of the power of man. Again, can you imagine uh, anyone putting forth that notion of, of politicians as gods? Right. Here we are in the 21st century. Well, you'd be run out of town. You'd be run out of town. There was a statue of George Washington that sat in the Capitol. He was unclothed. It was a, a model of a statue of Zeus. It was George Washington as a god. Right. And that did get run out of the Capitol building. When they thought of becoming godlike, the founders were probably thinking about perfecting their minds through science and learning. In Brown's novel, however, the villain Moloch believes something much more profound and potentially sinister. That the Freemasons from ancient times to the time of George Washington to the present day guarded secrets that could transform matter, transform a person, unleash incredible psychic and spiritual power. Most modern-day Masons say the Brotherhood is not nearly so mysterious. There is no deep, dark, intimate, and ultimate secret of Freemasonry which will transform the world in the way that the lost symbol portrays. It would be exciting if it were true, but such is not the case. That's what most Freemasons say, but not all. Sometimes it is said we have no secrets. Nothing could be further from the truth. Coming up, we go inside the Mason's secret chambers, where we witness rituals rarely seen. If you persevere, you will be purified. When Secrets of the Lost Symbol continues. In Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol, the hero, Robert Langdon, races through Washington, D.C., trying to unravel a secret Masonic message. He's forced to do it by Moloch. He threatens to kill a man who's both a dear friend of Langdon's and a 33rd degree Freemason. Moloch also uses blackmail, with evidence that some of Washington's most powerful men engage in Masonic rituals so bizarre, revealing them would bring down the government. 
Could the rituals of Freemasonry be that shocking? You decide. Masonry is a transformative art. It can be extraordinary in a man's life. It's speculative and alchemical and all those things. Cliff Porter is senior warden of Enlightenment Lodge 198 in Colorado. Brothers here say they are seeking eternal truths, learning ancient mysteries. What I take offense to is the fact that sometimes it is said we have no secrets or that what can be known about us can be Googled. Nothing could be further from the truth. Somewhat reluctantly, they opened a few of their doors to our cameras. They practice alchemy here, the ancient art that sought to turn lead into gold. You might think of alchemy as pseudoscience, but it's also been used through the centuries as a metaphor of personal transformation. This process of removing impurities to elevate it to something uh, greater and more special and more potent is very much what we also do within Freemasonry. Take good men and make them grow into something more special. Initiates go through a ritual that's meant to be intense and startling. First, the subject's vision is taken away with a hoodwink placed over his head. Then, a master mason, dressed as the Grim Reaper, issues a warning. If you persevere, you will be purified, you will overcome darkness, you will be enlightened. But if your soul is fearful, do not proceed. If you're not comfortable with what's going on, if you're nervous, if you think maybe you've approached the craft for the wrong reasons, you're given a chance to say, I I'm no longer okay with this. Sean Byer joined the Freemasons recently and went through the initiation. Those who elect to continue are led into a place the Masons would not let us show you, a chamber of reflection. You go into the chamber of reflection and you remove the hoodwink and you're presented with what is a, a, a very interesting image. And, and Dan Brown described it pretty well in his book. As Brown describes it, the chamber includes a human skull and bones, elements used in alchemy, and a pen and paper, where the initiate can write a last will and testament. Some of the symbols are meant to help you think about the fact that your life isn't going to go on forever. And um, frankly, it causes a very profound experience. In one of the most striking scenes in The Lost Symbol, Robert Langdon discovers a Masonic chamber of reflection at the center of American power. You described it as being located in the, in the bowels of the, of the Capitol. Did it exist? No. These chambers of reflection can exist anywhere. Right. Many Masonic lodges have them. There are Masons who have them in their homes. This kind of macabre symbolism has driven conspiracy theorists through the centuries to think the Freemasons practice some kind of black magic. Brown says Masonic rituals are no stranger than some other, more familiar ones. If a Catholic church, for example, pulled the shades and you heard through the grapevine that people were kneeling under a crucifix, an instrument of torture, and consuming blood and flesh ritualistically, uh, you might say, what a terrible organization. The Masons in Colorado say they embrace their symbolism and mysticism. But in many lodges across the country, the scene is a little different. I often tell people that if you like bake sales, join Freemasonry because that's what you're going to be doing. Mitch Horowitz, author of the book Occult America, says most Freemasons are far from mystical. They run a wonderful network of free children.